Welcome to Living Waters Fellowship, and if you're watching by YouTube or Facebook uh, or whatever, uh, we want to welcome you to our first Sunday of 2021. And uh, how many believe it's going to be a better year than 2020? And uh, I know it will be for God's people, because it really has nothing to do with what's happening in a world or whether it's viruses going on or government things that are happening that we don't agree with. Jesus has his kingdom, and we are in this world, but we're not of this world. We're of another kingdom. If you're a born-again believer, you are a child of God, and uh, that means that you were born again, born from above. And uh, we serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and I believe that he has a good plan for his people, for his church. So don't be discouraged. Don't give up. Uh, keep believing and keep serving, keep doing what God's called you to do, anointed you to do, and I believe we're going to see, we're going to see some fruit. Praise God. Hallelujah. Fruit that brings glory to Jesus Christ. And uh, we're just believing that God's going to open things up soon. And God's going to open up His church. I know some churches are meeting regardless, uh, filling up their auditoriums, their sanctuaries. And some churches are being fine because of it. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, there comes a time in God's work as God's people that we do need to take a stand. I just read a statistic today. We hear every day on the news how many people have got COVID, how many people are dying from COVID. But did you know that in 2020, 42 million babies were killed around the world from abortion? 42 million. And not even close to that have died from COVID-19. Uh, I wonder if people are weeping for these babies. I wonder if people are grieving and praying uh, for these people that feel that they have to have abortions, doctors that uh, perform these uh, abortions, that God will change their attitudes and change their heart. I'm not here to condemn anyone. Jesus did not come into this world to condemn. He came to save. And so what we need to do is we need to pray that the heart of people will change and realize that every life matters. Every life matters. Even the unborn babies that are in wombs, they're still a human being created in the image of God. And we need to pray that God will turn things around. And I believe he will. Uh, I also understand from the scriptures that uh, we're living in the last days. And uh, we know certain things are going to happen that uh, the Bible says are going to happen. And uh, whether it's Antichrist or the false prophet, uh, hard times, persecution, earthquakes, wars and rumors of wars, all kinds of things. But the Bible also says that the gospel is going to be preached to all the world, to all the nations, and then the end shall come. So one of the other predictions in the Bible is that Jesus is coming back again, literally coming back again. And until he comes, we have a job to do. We're called to occupy until Jesus comes. That means we're to continue to preach the gospel, to make disciples, and to do those things that God has called us and anointed us to do. I wanted to read to you a word for 2021. And... Uh, Diane, my wife, received this just the other day, and I want to read it to you. It's entitled, The Best Year Yet. You can worry, you can fret, or you can trust me for the best year yet. I have made you overcomers victorious in my name. My plans are not the plans of man. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. I will work everything out for the good as you walk in obedience before me. Have I not called you by name? Child, you are mine. Seek me for wisdom and truth. Do not listen to the plans and idle chatter of leaders. They have consorted against me and my people. It is time for my people to come into maturity, to be filled with my spirit and equipped with the full armor of God. Choose. Make your election clear. One way leads to life eternal, the other to folly and pain. Take up your cross and follow hard after me. This world is calling for a great reset, and they are about to find out that I, the Lord, shall not be mocked. 
The hatred the wicked hold against you shall increase, but they will witness my protection and abundance for my people. Come into the unity of my spirit. Listen to the counsel of the righteous. I will raise up the weak to confound the strong. Evil cannot hide from my mighty power. I will shake and topple their hiding places. Though the enemy lays a snare, you have witnessed and seen how my ways bring confusion and destruction to the, his camp. Remember, do not trust in riches. Do not hoard up for yourselves. Listen to me and obey my voice. The little you have in your house will be blessed. As you release it into my hands, see how I will bless it. My ways are clear. My ways are death to your flesh, but life to your spirit. Let my love and kindness be evident to all. Do not fear. Walk in my peace, advancing with righteousness, faith, and truth. Having done all to stand, know that I am with you, and I will never forsake my own. Go in my spirit, my anointing, for the time is short. And so I trust that you will hear that word, receive that word, and as the Bible teaches, uh, to consider all things and hang on to that which is good. And I believe that God has spoken to us today, that God is on our side, but more importantly, are we on God's side? Are we in God's boat? Because if you are in God's boat, you're not going to sink. Amen? Amen? Just like Noah in the ark. Once you get in there, you're safe. You're secure. And when God closes the door, no man can come in. So we are living in the day of grace. We're living in the day of God's salvation. And this is the day that you have an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. But there will come a day that it will be too late. And I pray that all of you will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. Uh, we're going to have communion later on this morning after my message. So if you're at home and you're watching and you want to participate, go ahead and get your bread and juice ready. And you can share with us after I share from God's Word. I'm going to read from three passages of Scripture to start with. And first of all, I'm going to Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1. And I'm going to read the first three verses. And then we're going to John 10 and then to Hebrews chapter 11. So beginning in uh, Psalms, starting at verse 1. And the title of my message today is Biblical Principles for Success in Life and Ministry. You realize that every one of you that is a Christian today, you're called into ministry. You don't have to have a title. You don't have to be a pastor, an evangelist, or a deacon or an elder in a church. All you have to be is a believer in Jesus Christ. And when you get called into the family of God, you get called into ministry. God wants you to serve in His kingdom. And God's Word has some principles how we can live a life of success and minister uh, with effectiveness so that our ministries will have spiritual fruit that will bring glory to God. Here in verse 1 of Psalms, it says this in chapter 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or seat, sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, and whatever he does prospers. This is speaking of the prosperity of the godly, the prosperity of the righteous. Whatever he does prospers. And you notice uh, when the psalmist here talks about meditation, he doesn't say empty your mind and think about nothing. He says fill your mind with the word of God. Meditate upon God's word day and night, and that will definitely lead you in a way of success and prosperity. And then John chapter 10, uh, in the New Testament, we have these familiar words. And I'm starting at verse 7. 
Jesus said, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever come before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they might have life and have it to the full or have it more abundantly. Jesus is the gate. And everyone that comes through Jesus will be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And he says there's a thief that comes in another way. And he comes to steal, he comes to kill, and he comes to destroy. So anything that's happening in your life that's stealing and robbing from you or, or, or destroying things in your life or, or killing dreams and visions in your life, it doesn't come from God. It comes from the thief. It comes from Satan. Jesus said, I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. This world doesn't understand that. They think that the church is somehow, we're killjoys. Uh, we're troublemakers. But the reality is Jesus came to this world to give this world life. To resurrect people from spiritual death. And the church has a ministry today. It's not a ministry of doom and gloom. It's a ministry of life. A ministry of hope. We have a message of hope for the world today. And Jesus wants to set you free. He wants to liberate you. He wants to give you abundance in your life. He wants to give you an abundance of peace. Of joy. Of purpose. And then I want to go to Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> the great chapter on faith. Hebrews chapter 11, and uh, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I will read the first six verses. Starting at verse 1, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commanded or commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. <clears throat> For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Hallelujah. Enoch pleased God. How did he please God? He was a man of faith. He was a man of faith. It wasn't about his giftings or talent. It was about his faith. And if we're going to be successful, we need to be people of faith. We need to spend time with Jesus. I believe that's the number one principle to a life of success and a ministry of success is spending time with our Lord, with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Spending time in His presence, spending time in prayer. Our greatest channel of communication is prayer. We need to be a people of prayer. And if you're going to make a resolution in 2021, if you haven't already made some, and, and the classic ones where I'm going to get in shape, or I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to try to eat better, and I'm going to try to lose weight and all those things, and I'm not saying those are bad things, but here's a resolution that I think will bring about dividends like nothing else, and that is committing yourself to be in prayer every day. Setting aside time like Daniel did. Three times a day. 
he set aside time to pray. And God wants us to spend time in his presence. Your abiding fellowship with Jesus is key to living a fruitful life. I mean, Jesus set the example. He spent time alone often with his heavenly father. He got alone at night, spent an entire night praying, worshiping, or being in the presence of his father, uh, uh, and enjoying him and listening to him. In fact, that's how Jesus' ministry was so successful. Because he didn't just go out into the world and do his own thing. He only did what he saw his father doing. He only said what he heard his father saying. And so we need to spend time in the presence of Jesus. Say, Lord, what are you saying to me today? Jesus, what do you want me to do? Jesus, I ask that you would guide me and direct me. And we need to spend time in his presence. As you abide in Jesus and his word, your prayers will be heard and your prayers will be answered. Hudson Taylor said this, when we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. How many want God working on your behalf? Hallelujah. You know, when we work and we strive and we try to do everything and figure everything out in our own strength, well, go ahead. We work. We're going to wear ourselves out. But when we pray, then God goes to work. You see, prayer changes things. Really what happens is prayer changes people. And people change things. I hear people saying, well, you know, there's a job that needs to be done. And they say, well, I'm just praying. I'm just praying. Well, yes, we need to pray. But we also need to rise up and begin to do what God calls us to do. Hospitals are not built unless somebody builds them. Orphanages are not built unless somebody builds them. Uh, we need to pray, but God calls us to go out and act upon our prayers in obedience. John 15 and 7 says, if you remain in me, abide in me. And my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. That's the key to successful prayer. Abiding in him, and abiding in his word, and having his word abide in you. Psalm says this, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. It sounds so open-ended. What do you mean, God? You, you're going to give me the desires of my heart? Yes, because you're abiding in me. You're delighting in me. <clears throat> and so when you delight in Jesus Christ, your desires begin to change. And so God's not worried that you're going to have some selfish desire, evil desire. Because if you're delighting yourself in the Lord, your desires are going to be godly desires. Your desires are going to be desires that want to honor Jesus and, and, and do the things that will bring victory and bring success into your walk with Jesus. Two conditions to successful prayer. Abide in Jesus and abide in his word. And then you can ask whatever you will and it will be given to you. Vance Abner said, Jesus is all we have and he is all we need. And all we want, we are shipwrecked on God and stranded on omnipotence. Totally dependent upon the power and the presence of God. I'm not leaning on my own abilities. I feel very inadequate in my own abilities. But when I put my faith in Jesus and my trust in God, then... I have unlimited power. I can do whatever God has called me to do. You can do whatever God's called you to do. Because you're not depending on your wisdom, your strength, your resources. You're depending on God. And He is omnipotent. He is sovereign. Dependence on Jesus is the second key to victory. Depending on Jesus. Leaning upon Him. Trusting in Him. Paul the Apostle said, I put no confidence in the flesh. And yet Paul was a very educated man. In the natural, he was very capable. He was very zealous for what he believed in. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. 
He was very legalistic. He kept the law to the best of his ability. I mean, he was very capable. But when he came to know Jesus Christ as Savior, <clears throat> he said, I put no confidence in my flesh. I put no confidence in my education. I put no confidence in my natural abilities. My confidence is in Jesus Christ. I depend upon him. Proverbs 3 and 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. He's not telling you to do away with your understanding. He's not saying that education is unimportant. Uh, it is important. We need to learn. We need knowledge. But he said, don't lean on your own understanding. Don't put all your weight on your own understanding. Rather, trust in me with all your heart. And I'm at that place in my life where, God, I'm just trusting you. As a pastor, where, where the churches are shut down and trying to decide what should we do and, and, and they're making laws and rules that we've got to follow. And yet I realize that God's also given us His Word and He's given us commandments what we are to do. And so God, I'm trusting you. I'm not trying to figure this out with my own understanding. I'm just leaning upon God, trusting in Him day by day. And I want to encourage you to do the same. Psalm 20 and verse 7, it says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some people trust in chariots and horses. Some people trust in uh, the weapons of this world. But we're called to trust in the name of the Lord our God. Psalm 37, 39. It says the salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. My salvation comes from the Lord. My deliverance comes from the Lord. I'm not trusting in government. I'm not trusting in man. I'm not trusting in my banker. I'm not trusting in some worldly counselor up there. I'm not trusting in the armies of men. I'm trusting in the name of the Lord. My salvation, my deliverance comes from the Lord. Zechariah, verse 6 of chapter 4, he says, It's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit says the Lord Almighty. And this word was addressed to Zerubbabel, the governor, who along with Joshua, the high priest, had been charged by the prophet Haggai with the task of rebuilding the temple. God's word to him is a reminder that the obstacles that face him in the rebuilding task will not be overcome by conventional resources or the might or the power of man instead, the resources will come from the outpouring of God's Spirit. You are going to build this temple not by your strength, but by my Spirit. And I think we need to come back to the place in the church of Jesus Christ and stop leaning upon technology, leaning upon entertainment and, and, and methodology, and come back to that place where we trust in the power of the Holy Spirit. We need a fresh Pentecost. We need the power of the Holy Spirit if we're going to accomplish what God's called us to accomplish. I mean, it's an impossible task that Jesus has called us to. He said we're to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. We can't do that in our own ability. We can have all kinds of strategies and methodologies, and, and, and yes, God can use those, but only when He anoints it. We don't come up with ideas and say, God, now bless it. We get on our knees before God and we say, God, what is your idea? What is your method? What is your plan? And then He will bless that. He doesn't have to bless my plan. He doesn't have to bless my agenda. He only blesses his plans and his agenda. That's where the anointing is. we got to find out, God, what are you doing? And get into the flow of the Holy Spirit. Psalm 84, 12 says, O Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. You want to be blessed? Trust in God. Blessed is the man, blessed is the woman who trusts in God. It's the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit that gives the victory. But it's through faith that the blessings and the promises of God are actualized. Even my salvation, even your salvation, 
Bible says in Ephesians, you were saved by grace. That means you're not saved by your human effort. You're not saved by your good life. You're not saved by your works. You were saved by grace, but it goes on to say through faith. I have to apprehend it. I have to receive it by faith. And even this is a gift from God. In John chapter 5 and verse 4, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, it says, And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. We're going to overcome by faith. We're not going to overcome by, uh, by human resources. We're not going to overcome by human wisdom. We're not going to overcome the, the, the decrees of the government that we don't agree with by just mere protests and writing letters. We're going to overcome by faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not saying we can't get involved and do some of these things, but we need to do it in faith. And whatever is not of faith is sin. Presumption is sin. We don't just presume upon God. We need to know God. We just don't presume upon the Word. We need to know the Word. We need to know that we're acting upon the Word, not just our presumptions, not just our good ideas. What does God's Word say? We're going to overcome by faith. It's not faith that is a mystical force out there in the universe somewhere that gives us the victory. It's our trust. It's our reliance on Jesus and the finished work of the cross that makes us overcomers. I believe that's where our faith is today. And that's where faith needs to be. Our faith needs to look back 2,000 years ago and remember what Jesus did for us. He died on the cross and he said on the cross before he died, it is finished. The debt has been paid in full. Your salvation is secure. Your sins have been forgiven. <clears throat> There's nothing more that you need to do. I have completed everything that's necessary for your salvation and for your victory. I paid the price. You don't have to pay the price. I paid the debt. You don't have to pay the debt. I forgave your sins. All you have to do is receive it by faith. And that includes everything. Every blessing, every promise we receive by faith. You see, faith is essential for a life of victory or fruitfulness. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Without faith, you cannot please God. It doesn't say without faith it's difficult to please God. It says without faith you cannot. You cannot please God. The righteous live by faith. By faith, the righteous live. Because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. This word reveals at least three components of faith. Number one, it involves a life of coming to God and seeking Him earnestly. Hebrews 4 and 16 exhorts us to approach the throne of God, the throne of His grace with confidence. In Hebrews chapter 10 and 22, it says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. The cross has opened the door for us to come to God with boldness. His shed blood has made it possible for us to come to God, to the Holy of Holies, with absolute confidence, with a sincere heart of faith. And we will find grace and we will find mercy to help us in our need. We're called to live lives of radical openness to and in conversation with God. It's amazing how many people try to hide from God. You can't hold any secrets with God. He knows your heart. He knows your motivations. He knows your thoughts. He knows your intents. You might as well just be honest with Him. You might as well come to God with confidence and boldness and say, God, 
Here's the truth. I'm broken. I'm hurting. I, I've, I've got a bondage. I'm sinning, Lord. You know all about it. And I'm confessing it to you. And he will not turn you away. Because the Bible says that he will never turn away those that come to him with a broken and a contrite spirit. Be honest with God. Tell him about your problems in life. Let him know your struggles you're having in your thought life, in your marriage, at work, whatever the situation is, your addictions or whatever they are. Just be totally open and honest. He knows about it anyway, but he wants you to confess it. And it's there that you will find victory. The life of faith involves believing that God exists. Now, this is very elementary, and it seems very obvious. I mean, obviously, we're Christian. We must believe that God exists. I mean, it is absurd to think that a person can sincerely come to God in prayer without a firm confidence in his existence. And this may seem obvious, but I believe there are many who pray hoping there really is a God out there somewhere. Imagine how many people pray. I'm not even sure if there's a God, but I've heard people actually saying, God, if you're really there, you know, sometimes actually God honors that. If you're sincere and honest, there are people that, that are finding themselves in problems and uh, desperate, ready to kill themselves, and they, they decide, well, I might as well just go ahead and try this. And God, if you're really there, show yourself to me. Make yourself real to me. And I heard one testimony. A guy was in a hotel room, ready to kill himself, take some pills or whatever, and, and, and he said, God, if you're really there, show yourself to me. And he happened to turn the TV on, and there was a preacher preaching. And I can't remember the details of what was being said, but whatever it was, he realized, yes, there is a real God. And he was set free. He was delivered. He didn't kill himself. And he was able to give a testimony of how God heard that prayer. God is faithful. God sees the sincerity of our heart. The people in our world today that maybe they don't know God. Maybe they're struggling and whatever. But the Bible says, if you want to know me, you can know me. If you will seek me with all your heart, you will find me. If you're real, if you're honest... Uh, and you sincerely want to know me, I will make myself known to you. There's another problem is that some Christians pray, but they're not sure God hears or even really cares. Does God really care about my problem? Does God really care about my need? Is God really hearing what I pray? And, and we treat prayer like uh, uh, going to the casino or, you know, playing... Uh, the roulette wheel or, you know, the one-armed bandit. I guess they don't use the one-armed bandit anymore. You just push buttons or whatever. Uh, and, and they just, you know, I'm going to throw up a few prayers and hopefully one of them will stick. That's not how you pray. you got to pray in faith. you got to believe in, in your heart that God hears. And if you know that He hears you, you know that you will receive what you've asked of Him. That's what 1 John chapter 5 tells us. I know that God hears me. And I know that Ephesians says the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. The prayer of a righteous woman is powerful and effective. And you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If you're a Christian today, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You say, yeah, but I'm not perfect. Well, who is? I'm not perfect, but Jesus is perfect. And I'm covered in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> And that's why God's doing the work of sanctification. It's a progressive work. I am sanctified, but I'm also being sanctified. I have been set apart, but I'm also being cleansed and renewed in my mind as I study and read the Word of God. And as a result, my life is being transformed. And this leads to the third aspect of a life of faith. Confidence that God not only hears and cares but that he will reward those who seek him. How many believe that God wants to reward you? He wants to reward you. Some, some people have such a bad attitude about themselves and, uh, and, and they think, oh, God's never going to reward me. God never, I don't deserve it. Well, none of us deserve it. We're all saved by grace. <clears throat> We've all been sinners. We were all lost. 
We're all saved here today because of the kindness and goodness of God, not because of our own goodness. But if you will seek Him earnestly, He said, I will reward you. The patriarchs were not commended for their achievements or their talent. They were commended for their faith. That's what it says in Hebrews. All these ones that were listed in Hebrews chapter 11, they were not commended for what they accomplished. They were commended for their faith. As a result of their faith, they did achieve great things. Actually, God achieved great things through them. God will achieve great things through your obedience as well. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, Abel was commended as a righteous man. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. This is not saying that God used faith to create the universe, as some people teach. It means we trust, we have faith, that God spoke the universe into existence, even though we cannot understand how He was able to accomplish it with just a decree. But by faith, I believe that when God said, let there be light, there was light. And I know there's an ongoing debate about the six days of creation, whether the 24-hour days or was it a long period of time. And I don't want to get into that debate today, but just to say this, however it happened, God did it, and God is able to do it if He wants to in six 24-hour days. A lot of people try to figure it out with their mind. Well, how could that be? How could God create the universe in six literal days? Well, I don't know how He can do it except that He's all God. He's all powerful. He's sovereign. And God can do what He wants to do. <clears throat> how did God save you? How could God uh, uh, transform your life in an instant? The moment you said, Jesus saved me, in that split second, your old nature was gone and He gave you a new nature. You're born again. I don't know how God does that, but He can do it because He's God. How does God raise the dead? How does God heal the sick? How does God multiply the, the loaves and the fish to feed thousands? I don't know, but He's God. And by faith, I believe that He created the universe by His Word. He spoke it into existence. By faith. By trusting in Him. Hebrews speaks of at least 19 persons of faith and many others who are not mentioned by name. And all these heroes of faith, to whom the New Testament believers look for inspiration, were Old Testament persons. How much more, as New Testament people, should we have mountain-moving faith? You see the great accomplishments and miracles that happened to People like Moses and Abraham and David and, and Samson and, uh, and, and others as well. How much more as those that have been born again of God's Spirit. Who have the Holy Spirit not only with them but dwelling within them. How much more faith should we have? That we can move mountains in the name of Jesus. That we can overcome giants. Even the faith of a mustard seed. The size of a mustard seed can move mountains. It's not how much faith you have, it's the faith that you do have. Are you operating in it? Are you exercising that faith? To have faith in God means that you trust God and His promises. In no biblical sense can it be possible to have faith in a God you do not trust. Faith is acting upon God's word. Faith is to trust in the character of God. A lot of people brought up maybe with fathers that were not very 
reliable, trustworthy. And so you relate your heaven or your earthly father to the heavenly father. I'm going to tell you they're not even the same. Not even close in many cases. Your heavenly father has the character that you can trust in. Faith is to trust in God's faithfulness and his attributes. He is omnipotent. He has the power to do what he says he promises to do. He's all powerful. He's omniscient. He can. He knows all things. He has all knowledge. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. So no matter where you find yourself, in the depths of the despair, God's there with you in that depth of despair. You can't hide from God. If you're a Christian, He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. In Bloomfield's uh, lexicon, written in 1835, and even though it's out of print, uh, but there's this quote that I want to share with you about faith, and I, I think it really is worth repeating. Faith is not only firmly persuaded that Christ is who he said he is, but it, is also, uh, it also includes the idea of hope and expectation. It is called the good faith. Faith is the essential trait of Christian life and character. It is a firm conviction and confiding belief that Jesus as God and man is one with the Father and worthy of our total trust. Faith never rests in a doctrine, but always in the person Jesus and the trustworthiness of the person Jesus Christ. My trust is in Jesus today. And you say, well, his word, uh, Jesus and his word are basically the same. You know, if I'm trusting in Jesus, then I'm going to trust in his word. But how do I come to trust in Jesus? I come to trust in Jesus by knowing his word. For faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. But my faith is in the person of Jesus Christ. And because I have faith in Jesus, I can trust whatever he says. Because the Bible says it is impossible for God to lie. We have a lot of unbelieving believers today. Where is our faith? Are we going to trust God's word or are we not going to trust God's word? Do we believe that God has a plan and purpose for his church? Do we believe that he is our divine protection and our covering? That he is our savior, our healer, our provider, our protector, our counselor? He is our everything. We just have to trust him. One Christian leader and author wrote, I see so many Christians who are struggling to believe and struggling to have faith. Their focus is all wrong. They're focusing on their ability or inability to believe God or trying to have faith. They should simply start acting like God's word is true. It will, it will make all the difference in their lives. It is when we know God's word is true and act like it's true that it becomes a reality to us. Faith is not something we have so much as it is something that we do. Stop trying to believe. Stop trying to have faith and just trust. Enter into that rest. Habakkuk 2 and 4, as well as other references, say the just shall live by faith. The word faith here in Hebrew is uh, emuna, and it means faith that is steadfast, firm, and has endurance. The just shall live by being filled with faith. It, it's a, a, a faith-filled action. It's not a static thing. It's not a passive thing. Faith in the New Testament is active. We show our faith by what we do. A set of beliefs that we just give mental assent to 
is not saving faith. And it is not delivering faith. Faith is active. When we truly trust God, we will obey God. And if we are obedient, God is faithful to reward us and to keep his promises on our behalf. Obedience is the true test of faith. Abraham was tested. His promised son Isaac, he said, God said, I want you to take your son and I want you to sacrifice him. Abraham was prepared to do it. Because he believed that God could even raise the dead. But he was going to obey his God. He acted upon the word of God. And if faith is going to work in your life, you've got to act upon it. You've got to act upon the word of God. And trust God that he is going to back up his word. Hebrews 10, 35 and 36 says this. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Do you have confidence today? It's another word for faith. Do you have confidence in the promises of God? In regards to whatever your need is, do you have confidence? Because Hebrews realizes, uh, the author of Hebrews realized, we're, we're, we're tempted to get discouraged. We're tempted to give up. Patience and faith go together. Endurance and faith go together. The patience of faith. And he says, do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. In due season. You've got to be patient. He said, but I've been waiting months, days, years, or whatever. Be patient. Keep believing. <clears throat> Keep your confidence up. Keep encouraging yourself in the Lord. Keep feeding your mind the scriptures. Because your confidence will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere. So that when you have done the will of God. You will receive what he has promised. Either God's word is true or it's not true. And I believe it is true. Do the will of God. And you will receive what he has promised. Many if not most of God's promises are conditional. For example, when you have done the will of God, then you receive what he has promised. That's what Hebrews says here. When you have done the will of God, I don't know what God's will is for you. I don't know what God's speaking to you. I know the Bible gives us certain things and, and, and things that we're to abide by and obey, but God may be specifically speaking to you about something. Putting on your heart, convicting you about. And you don't want to do it because it's uncomfortable, it's inconvenient, or you're afraid or whatever. You say, Lord, I, I don't want to do that. Well, you're not going to receive the blessing that God has for you until you do it. God has given even a prescription for our healing. And it's not take two aspirin and I'll call you in the morning. It says this in the word of God in James. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him. Anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up and if he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you will be healed. That is a New Testament prescription for the church for healing. And there's no list of negative side effects if you take this prescription. If you're sick, call for the elders of the church. <clears throat> What are you supposed to do? Well, do what it says. Call for the elders and ask to be anointed. Don't wait for them to come to you. You go to them. And then it speaks of confession of sins. And you'll be forgiven. 
Earlier on in James, it says, faith without works is dead. It is useless. Faith is an act. Faith is an act. It's a quote from Smith Wigglesworth, one of the great men of faith. Faith is an act. Act upon the Word of God. Do what it says. In all things give thanks. You say, well, I don't know what to do. What's the will of God? In all things, in all certain, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Praise God. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. <clears throat> Many scriptures that tell us what we are to do as believers. And if we will act upon God's word, then God will go to work on our behalf. It's not just hearing the word that gives us strong faith. Jesus said it's the doers of the word who develop a strong foundation for their lives. Not just those that hear. Because those that just hear but don't act upon it and obey the word of God, they're building their lives upon sand. They have no foundation. They're on shifting sand. When the storm comes, their life is totally destroyed. Shipwrecked. But when you hear the word and act upon the word and do what the word says, then you have a foundation that is secure. And when the storms of life come, you will remain standing. Because you're not just a hearer, you're a doer. You see, unbelief hinders the supernatural from working in our life. We know that even from Jesus' ministry. He said, I could not, amongst my own people, I could not do any miracles except heal a few sick people because of your unbelief. It wasn't just doubt. It was unbelief. Hardened in their heart. They did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They didn't believe that Jesus could do the miracles. They didn't believe that he was who he said he was. It wasn't just a matter of, well, I have some doubts. We all have doubts. There are times that that we believe, but at the same time, we don't believe. But we're not hardened in that position. We're just saying, Lord, I'm human. I'm struggling to believe. I'm struggling. But Lord, help me with my unbelief. Lord, increase my faith. And the Lord says, well, faith comes by hearing. And hearing the word of God. And if you believe, then you will obey. The children of Israel would not go into the promised land because of unbelief and disobedience. They disobeyed because they did not believe that they had the ability to overcome the giants. They allowed fear to rule them rather than faith. And I think we're living in a day like that today because of what's going on in the world. We're allowing fear to rule us rather than faith. We need to get our mind into the word of God more often Get our eyes into the Word of God more often than we do on YouTube and on the news media. We need to fill our mind with the faith that comes from this Word. And then we've got to act upon it. It says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Unless there's a virus that's a pandemic that's covered the earth, then we've got to stay home. Well, how long are we going to do that? Maybe we would do it for a few weeks, but there comes a point where the church says it's time for us to rise up. It's time for us to get busy because while we're waiting at home, thousands if not millions of people are dying and going to a lost eternity. We need to rise up and thank God for technology. Thank God that some people are hearing the gospel through technology. But there are many people in the world that aren't watching, that cannot watch in parts of the world. And we need missionaries and evangelists and men and women of God that will shake off the fear and rise up in faith and say, God, I'm going to do what your word says and I'm going to believe that you're going to divinely protect me and cover me as I go about doing your will. It says, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. How am I going to lay hands on these sick people here today if I have to stay six feet away? i got to make a decision. I'm going to trust God or am I not going to trust God? Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Not faith in faith. Faith in God. 
Not faith in my ability, faith in God. And today I have faith that my sins are forgiven, that I have eternal life because of what Jesus did on Calvary. And we're going to celebrate communion together here. And if you're at home, I want to invite you to go ahead and get your, your crackers and your juice, bread and juice, whatever. And, and there's some over here on my left, those that are here this morning, if you want to go ahead and, and go ahead and uh, take your emblems. And we're going to receive, share communion together this morning. Communion is a time of remembrance. It's a memorial. And it's for those that have been born again, those that are Christians. Your sins have been forgiven. And so we're celebrating. We're going to celebrate what Jesus has done for us. And uh, we know that when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't die for his sins, he died for our sins. He is a perfect lamb, without spot, without sin, without stain. And he died there 2,000 years ago. So communion is a time of looking back in faith and saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing your life to be spilled out, your blood, so that my sins can be forgiven. But it's also a time of looking forward because Jesus said we will do this until he comes. Jesus is coming back again. And when he comes back, we're going to share wine and bread together with Jesus, our Savior. We're going to share a festival or a feast, I should say, and a time of celebration. So we look forward to that day. But until he comes, we're to regularly break bread together. We're regularly to, to drink of the wine together. And the bread represents his body that was broken for us. The juice represents his blood that was shed for us. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. The Bible says there is no more sacrifice for sin. The only way that you can have your sins forgiven is through Jesus Christ and his shed blood. The Bible says in Isaiah and then 1 Peter as well, it says by his stripes we we're healed in Isaiah and then Peter it says by his stripes we are healed. He carried in his body our infirmities so that we can be healed. He bore our sorrows so that we can be forgiven and healed. And, and so it's a time of celebration. This is a serious time and we take it seriously but this is a time of joy and celebration. We're free today. We're forgiven today. We're remembering this morning that Jesus did everything that was necessary for our salvation, for our deliverance, and for our healing. So I want you to open your hearts in faith and receive your miracle this morning. And thank Him for your forgiveness today. And if you have anything in your heart today that would hinder you from receiving communion, any unforgiveness, any bitter, just give it to the Lord. Just say, Lord, forgive me, and I forgive those that have hurt me as well. Lord, as you have forgiven me, I forgive them. From my heart, I forgive them. I forgive them for what they've done. I forgive them for what they said. I'm not condoning what they did, but I'm forgiving them that debt. Just like you forgave me, Lord. You didn't condone my sin. You forgave my sin because you paid for my sin. And so, Lord, we just pray you bless our communion. Bless, Lord, as we partake and share together of the bread and the wine representing your body that was broken for us and your blood that was shed for us. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's all receive together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for laying your life down for your body that was broken for me. I receive my healing now. And after the eight, 
Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you receive it in remembrance of me. Let's all receive it together. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your shed blood. There's still power in the blood today. Lord, I praise you and I thank you for this time we've had together. And I pray, Lord God, that we, O oh God, this morning will rest in you. Our trust is in you, Lord Jesus. That we would cease from striving, cease from anxiety and worry, and we would rest in the finished work of the cross where you died. We thank you, Lord, that you did not only die, but you rose again as you promised you would on the third day. And because you live, we shall live also. Jesus, we look forward to your appearing. We look forward to that day, Lord. We, we anticipate your coming. We're expecting you to come at any time, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord, but until that time, help us to live by faith as we walk about in these bodies. Lord, as we live, Lord, help us to live by faith and not by sight. Help us not to be ruled by what we see in the natural, but help us to be led by your Spirit. Help us to see through the eyes of faith today that Jesus, you are sitting at the right hand of your Father. And you are in a place of authority. And we are seated with you in heavenly places. We are in positions of authority as well. And you've called us to rule and to reign in this life. And by your grace and by faith in your name, we will walk in victory. And we will accomplish what you called us to accomplish. And Lord, we pray for our world. We pray for our governmental leaders. We ask God that you bring them, oh God, to a place where they realize that they haven't got the answers of themselves, but they need to call upon you, Jesus. I pray that you raise up men and women of God into government, men and women that have influence with leaders, that they, oh God, will be able to speak into the lives of prime ministers and presidents, kings and queens. Jesus, we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. See you next Sunday.